<laughs> Sorry, I wasn't sure who was going to take that one. Okay, all right. <laughs> but yeah, I let's, like that. Uh, <laughs> let's start that one over. So, what do you, so, so Laura, what do you think of that? Welcome once again to Free Associations from the Boston University School of Public Health, the Public Health and Medical Journal Club podcast for anyone who is as confused by the latest health study as I am by how long we are going to continue to be working from home. How are you guys, uh, how are you guys doing with the work from home thing? It feels like it's been a very, very long time. Who, who was it? It does. Was it, uh, somebody said that, uh, last week was the longest year of my life. (laughs) I think that is how I feel right now. Yeah. I mean, March already is always a long month, I think. It's true. It's true. It was even worse this year. It's terrible. It's going to be. It's going to be bad. Uh, so I'm Matt Fox from the Departments of Epidemiology and Global Health, and I am here with Dr. Jennifer Ryder. Hello. From the Department of Epidemiology and Dr. Laura Sampson. For the first time, Woo-hoo. I get to say that on air. <laughs> we should probably wait till I get my diploma in the mail, just in case. <laughs> that but, uh... is, so that is technically true. I suppose we do. Where you're technically not supposed to use the term until you have actually received the diploma, but you know, I don't care. <laughs> uh, and I can't say that we are in the godly studio because we are now remote, uh, all working from our homes and recording. So if we have any issues with the audio, um, we are doing our best. And as a reminder, if you could head on over to the Population Health Exchange website at www.pophealthex.org, there's something new and fun there this time. We've got our uh, mini MPH for those of you who, uh, I guess if you're listening to this podcast, you probably have an MPH or you're in an MPH program. But if you're looking to uh, explain to others what an MPH is all about, we've got a, a mini MPH course that's there that you can go on and do for free. So that's a that's a really nice bonus. So we have a new uh, review that I wanted to read, which I was really excited about. So it's a five-star review and it says, my only regret is not discovering this earlier. And it says, I have become a staunch listener of this podcast. It's at one, It's at once entertaining and educational. The papers they pick are fun and interesting, but beyond that, I have learned so much about research methods through their discussions. Podcast is well-produced. The sound quality is divine, Nick. Divine. And the content (laughs) is beautifully structured and organized. So, uh, dear Matt, Jen, and Chris, and the rest of the production team, please keep making these because I don't know what I'd do if you stopped. (laughs) So that's pretty awesome. Matt, did you write that review? I did. I did. And the... (laughs) There should be ones coming in from family members of mine. So, you know, <laughs> this is what I do. I've got a lot of time at home, so we're going to get a lot of five-star ratings. It's a bit of a pain because I have to set up new accounts every time, <laughs> but, you know, it's worth it. Well, it's a very nice review. So now onto the show. So today in our Journal Club segment, which is our first segment, we are going to look at a study on the effect of cycling and hospitalizations. Then in our second segment, we will uh, do our deep dive on what I think is a beautiful example of self-correction in science. And then in our Amazing and Amusing, we will get into some things that will make us laugh out loud. And I do want to um, just remind everyone that if you didn't tune into our last podcast where we just talked about how we were doing with the whole shift in working from home, where we said we're not going to take on covid related studies for a while. Um, We kind of feel like we have to wait for the evidence to accumulate before we can really get too deep into the weeds on COVID-19 studies. And besides, if you're like me, you're looking for a break from COVID-19 stuff. So we are going to be focused on the rest of the world. So let's get into segment one. So we're going to talk about a study that looked at the impact of cycling on hospital admissions published in the BMJ And this study was titled Association of Injury-Related Hospital Admissions with Commuting by Bicycle in the UK, a Prospective Population-Based Study. It was by first author Claire Welsh of the Institute of Cardiovascular and Medical Sciences in the University of Glasgow. And I pulled out a couple of headlines on this one. So New Scientist says why the health benefits of cycling to work outweigh the risk of injury. And Medical Express says cycling to work linked to higher risk of injury-related hospitalizations among UK commuters. So, Jen, let me start with you. Can you tell us what they did in this study? 
Absolutely. So as you mentioned, this is a study that was conducted in uh, the UK. And in the UK, like in the US, not enough adults are getting the recommended amount of physical activity. And active commuting could be one solution to that problem. We already know that active commuting, including cycling, has known health benefits um, and is associated with lower all-cause mortality. But even though 39% of UK residents own a bike, only about 4% cycle to work. There is a study that is conducted uh, regularly in the UK, the British Social Attitude Survey, that indicates that about two-thirds of adults actually think cycling is too dangerous. Uh, Mm. But there's actually limited evidence on the real risks and injuries associated with cycling. So that was really the rationale for conducting this study. The cohort that they use is the UK Biobank cohort, and it includes about half a million participants aged 37 to 73 years, a little over half are women. These participants are recruited from all across the UK, and they were brought into the study between 2006 and 2010. There was a baseline questionnaire that included health and lifestyle questions. There was also a physical examination and biological specimen collection, all as part of this this cohort. In order to obtain information on the outcomes, they linked to death records to obtain the date and the cause of death, but also to hospital encounters to obtain information on injuries. They had to exclude a fair number of participants. So the biggest reason for exclusion was that people were not working. So 238,263 individuals were excluded for that reason. They also excluded participants whose commuting distances were sort of unusual, so more than 200 miles participants who had uh, their number of commutes per week uh, more than 12 or missing covariate data. For measuring the exposure, uh, there was a question on the questionnaire that asked the participants, what types of transports do you use to get to and from work? So they could choose multiple responses, uh, and the options were car or motor vehicle, walking, public transport, or cycling. And from that information, they derived uh, several different categories. So a non-active commuting category, walking, cycling, mixed mode walking, or mixed mode cycling. So this study, the cycling definition was stricter than in most of the the previous studies. They also evaluated a binary cycle versus not exposure. Because this is a large established cohort, they have a lot of covariates. So they have a five-level leisure time physical activity score derived from the number of days doing 10 or more minutes of moderate or vigorous physical activity. They have an urban versus rural home location, BMI, smoking and alcohol intake, and then a number of comorbidity at baseline, including cardiovascular disease, cancer, depression, long-standing illness, diabetes, and hypertension. In terms of their outcome definition, they were specifically interested in the first event of an injury that was based on ICD-10 codes that resulted in a hospital admission. They had follow-up through either the injury date, November 2016 in Scotland, or January 2018 in England or Wales, or of course, the date of death. Their assumption in doing these analyses is that an excess risk of injury occurred as a result of commuting differences for their primary analysis, where they were just looking at any type of injury that resulted in hospital admission. But they did do a secondary analysis where they were looking specifically at events being coded as related to transport. They also looked at the association of commuting mode with um, morbidity and mortality. So in terms of their statistical analysis, they looked at the incidence rate of the first injury resulting in hospitalization episode by each commuting group per 10,000 miles commuted and also by 1,000 person years. To do these calculations, they had to make a number of assumptions. So they were assuming that people were walking at 3.4 miles per hour, cycling at 8.3 miles per hour, or driving at 27.6 miles per hour. Their Cox proportional hazard models adjusted for age, sex, uh, and then also for ethnicity, 
the Townsend deprivation score, comorbidities, BMI, smoking, alcohol, and physical activity. And they also did a number of stratified analyses. So in the end, they had a total of 230,390 participants who were followed for a median of 8.9 years. 52% of them were women, and on average, they were aged 52.4 years. 2.5% of those participants exclusively cycled to work. And as you might expect, compared to the non-active commuters, they tended to be younger, lower BMI. They were more likely to be white, male, less likely to be a smoker or have comorbidities, and they had higher leisure time physical activity. There were 5.8% who were considered mixed mode cyclists, and those were also, those participants were also generally healthier than the non-active commuters. There were a total of 10,201 injuries among the participants resulting in either hospitalization or death. They were among participants who were older, who tended to be white, male, smokers, and also have comorbid conditions. They were slightly more likely to be physically active. 397 of the participants, so that's 7% of the exclusive cyclists, and 806 participants, so 6% of the mixed mode cyclists, had injuries resulting in hospitalization. So in terms of exclusive cycling, this is equivalent to an incidence rate of 8.06 events per 1,000 person years. For mixed mode cycling, it was an injury rate of 6.99 per 1,000 person years. Whereas in the non-active commuting group, the incidence rate was 4.96 per 1,000 person years. In the multivariable analysis, after adjustment for all the covariates, there was a 45% higher rate of injury for exclusive cycling and 39% higher rate of injury for mixed mode cycling compared to non-active commuting. The absolute risk difference, which compared people who cycled to work at all versus did not, was 2.59 injuries per thousand person year. And they did some a nice description of the real impact of, of uh, cycling versus non-active commuting. So for every 1,000 people who changed commuting to include cycling for 10 years, that would result in an additional 26 first injuries. For transport-related incidents, which they looked at specifically, the hazard ratios, as you would expect, were much larger, so 3.42 for exclusive cycling and 2.62 for mixed-mode cycling. But all of this was weighed against the potential benefits of cycling to work. So any cycling to work was associated with a 20% reduction in risk of CVD, an 11% reduction in cancer diagnosis risk, and a 12% reduction in all-cause mortality. So overall, it seems like they have found some harm associated with uh, an increase in injuries, but also a reduction in other health outcomes that would outweigh that. And so it seems that their conclusion is that while there is an increased risk of harm, on average, the overall net effect, they would say, is better, assuming that we buy their analysis. So Laura, tell us what you what you thought of this study. Sure. So I had mixed feelings. I'll start with what I liked uh, mm -hmm. about the study, which was, you know, first, this is a really large uh, cohort study. And the I thought the outcome assessment in particular was good. So not based on self-report. I imagine the hospital records, um, especially in the UK, are likely to be pretty accurate here. I also liked the visual abstract. I thought that was cool. You don't see that all the time. Great. Can you can you say what that is for, for oh, listeners? Oh, sure. So this is basically in the paper. They have a little visual, like a box that has some pictures and some graphics that explain the study design, the overall summary, and the key results graphically, which is cool. So they have little symbols. Yeah, I thought it was really nice. Key points. So I thought that was a really nice way of quickly understanding the results of the study without reading like a dense paragraph of the abstract. So I like that. Some of the issues I thought were, from my point of view, first, I thought that there was a lot of causal language used in this paper. Mm -hmm. And although they did have some statements like, you know, for example, in the abstract, they say assuming causal relationships, and then they state more 
uh, of their assumptions. But I think there were a lot of potential jumps between the, the findings and, for example, potential policy interventions. So there was a couple of statements about how, you know, since cycling is associated with injuries, that perhaps we need policy interventions to make the infrastructure, for example, safer, which is probably mm -hmm. true, but I think that's not what this study necessarily evaluated. So I thought they did make some potential leaps there. And also I thought that the exposure assessment was based on a lot of estimation and assumptions. So as Jen mentioned, for example, they assumed that they assumed the speeds that people were biking at and walking at and I'm not completely sure I understand how those were derived. And then people also had to estimate the distance they were commuting, which I'm not sure would necessarily be valid. I'm not sure I could tell you the distance exactly between my home and work. 9.4 9 miles. <laughs> That's how long yours is? Yes. Do you drive? Yes. So I think that people who drive would have a better assessment of that, which I'm not sure whether or not that would affect results. But. I would I would agree with you though. But wait, can I so can I just stop yeah. you there for a second sure. because you mentioned the exposure assessment which I agree with you I think is an area of, you know, potential for misclassification and I'm curious because how do you how do you think about this particular exposure in the sense that it's not a point exposure. It's not something that just happens once and we assess the effects of. So in some senses, it's much more like a, a diet study where you are accumulating the exposure over an entire lifetime and then we're assessing you know, the short-term impacts. On the other hand, mm, it isn't quite like diet in that it's a bit cleaner in that we, are, we really are interested in the effects of my cycling at this particular moment on my risk of injury right now, which I think, you know, makes it a lot cleaner compared to diet where we're saying, you know, eating a certain food, we don't necessarily believe that eating a cookie on day X is causing my heart attack immediately. I mean, it may contribute to a lifetime of eating cookies that contributes to my heart attack. So I, I, I don't know exactly where to put this in the in the pantheon of potential types of exposures, but I, I thought it was interesting and I wondered what your take on that was. Right. Yeah, I agree. This is probably an easier estimation than food intake. But at the same time, we still have the issue of this being a point in time, right? Because I think they just assessed commuting at the baseline interview, if I'm if I'm correct. So they so it could yes. be that someone biked a lot at baseline, but then like in the next few years, they stopped biking to work and they would still be classified as someone who's exposed. So this isn't a time varying exposure, which right. I think could be and, problematic. And also, and it was just based on one question. And then, as you said, a lot of assumptions. And I was trying to imagine how I would answer this question. And I don't think my response would allow correct inference about how much I was actually, how much active time I was actually spending. I would not have ended up in this, any cycling category, but I think I would have ended up classifying myself as a non-active commuter, which isn't completely accurate. And so, okay. So do you agree with me or do you share the feeling that I have though, that the assessment of the exposure is, I agree with you, it has the potential for misclassification, but mm -hmm. it's probably not so bad for trying to assess the effect on injuries. Whereas if you want to then assess the effect of the cycling on cardiovascular disease, which they're also doing, that is more problematic because to me, it's not the effect of the cycling today affects whether or not I get into an accident today. It's the accumulation of a long period of exercise that is probably correlated with other exercise behaviors in addition, but it's that it's that entirety of the exposure, the accumulation of the exposure that matters. Whereas for one, I think it, it's closer to a point exposure. Yeah. I mean, I think the the fact that you would need to evaluate people over a much longer time frame to look at cardiovascular disease or all cause mortality makes that single baseline exposure assessment much more problematic. I agree. Yeah, me too. And I also think that there were other problems with this other analysis of associations with CBD and cancer. So for example, so Matt, as you said, they, your commute patterns are likely associated with your other physical activity patterns, which they did try to, they did control for, but it seems like a pretty rudimentary 
I agree. Estimation. Five categories, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I wondered, I think the question was how much time of moderate physical activity do you do each week? And that they use that as the control, but how do we know that people did not count the cycling for their commute as part of that? You know, like mm-hmm, I wonder whether mm-hmm. that would affect. And then I also thought we're making a big assumption here that if people don't bike, that they would be doing less exercise. But I don't know, like I, I thought about biking to work. I don't currently do it. And I've thought about it. And I wonder if that would just make me exercise less on the whole, right? Like I think we're making a lot of assumptions that if we start cycling, that we're going to suddenly have all these health benefits only when we do this for commuting. Does that make sense? Oh yeah. So do either of you cycle to work? No. Nope. Okay. So I don't cycle to work either, but I used to. And I was told that I, I needed to stop doing that once I had children because I needed to uh, be a father to my children and the streets of Boston <laughs> are too dangerous for that. But I know I can tell you that for me, when I, when I cycled to work, I counted that as my exercise and I didn't exercise outside of that. So it wasn't exactly. the same thing. So th- those were not some things that I would necessarily separate out. Okay, so we we talked a fair bit about the misclassification of the exposure and also the you know the exposure definition, which I think are real issues. I'm curious also your thoughts about potential for selection bias. And I have a couple of different ways I want to explore that. But in first, let me just start with the simplest, which is the sentence, we excluded participants who had not provided info on commute, uh, on their commuting practices, also those who did not work, and they excluded 238,000 odd people. The total sample size, I think, was obvi- was somewhere in the neighborhoods of 230,000. Yeah, that, right? that yep, struck that's me correct. as pretty concerning. I mean, I, I guess I understand taking out people who don't work because if what you're really interested in is commuting here, I guess that makes sense. Well, was, well, wait, 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 wait. why wait. couldn't they just be non-active commuters? Yeah. I mean, non-commuters. Well, I think the issue is that people want to weigh the risk benefit ratio, at least the way I read this, of like biking compared to driving to work. Because you would still expect mm-hmm. to have injuries from car accidents. So if you're not leaving the house to go to work, although you could be going to school, so maybe they should have incorporated that or somewhere else. But I think it's a different, I sort of understand why you might be excluding those people because they, they don't have an exposure either way. Right. I mean, well, yeah, I think, I think sit in his commuting, but at the same time, I mean, who, not right? Yeah, I think it was my biggest criticism of this paper, which otherwise I I really really liked. But I think excluding people who are not working, they're excluding likely the most unhealthy participants in the UK biobank cohort, right? Definitely, likely people who already potentially have a higher risk of. CBD or all-cause mortality, potentially. Do you agree, Matt? I do. I do. And also potentially people who would otherwise be less inclined to cycle to work. I mean, although in theory, they might be might have more time to be able to exercise outside of work. That's probably not the case given the the other issues that are going on here. But okay, so I can I can I can talk myself into two different uh, rationales for this. The first is if you are not commuting to work, you you have no ability to cycle to work and therefore we could put you as not cycling. The comparison wasn't really not cycling though, it was they were comparing to well, I, they, I suppose they were, but they were comparing to not, to walking and other forms of, of driving and driving. So in that sense you could say, okay, exclude them because they don't have any of those. And if we were doing this as a trial. You, you would certainly exclude them, right? You would only include people who are commuting to work and then you would randomize them to one of these different modes of uh, getting to work. So to me, in, in that sense, it makes sense. So I can go either way. But what, what's interesting to me is I didn't get a breakdown for how many were excluded because they didn't have any information and how many were excluded because they were not commuting to work, in which case I can't really assess how many people were legitimately excluded or not, which is where I kind of struggled. But they did did include people who commuted to work, but commuted less than 
so people who had a zero commuting distance, yeah. right? Which is all of us right now. <laughs> um, so it doesn't. Uh, so that part of it is uh, what a good point. didn't make sense to me is that you could still be someone who doesn't leave your house and you were included, but yet you had to be employed. Well, I thought I, I thought they said that. My understanding of that was if the distance rounded to zero, they counted it as like 0.3 miles, which seemed really arbitrary. But I took that to mean they are commuting. It's just a really short distance. Is that what you're talking about? I mean, in a a trial, you would certainly not include anyone who was commuting less than a mile. So I don't know. It's a a tricky one to to say whether it's right or wrong. What we don't know is how much potential bias there is because of it. And and as I say, it becomes tricky to assess. But let me go to the the second issue of selection bias, which is so the UK biobank study, there has been criticized. Uh, There are a number of people who are friends and colleagues of ours who have been very critical of the UK biobank study for a number of different reasons. But one of which is the potential for selection bias, because there may be different factors which cause selection into a study like the UK Biobank study, where, you know, my understanding is you would have to have, you know, blood draws and things like that and allow access to your medical records, some of which may be related to the exposure, some of which may be related to your outcome. And when you condition on participation, you get selection bias by by that design feature. I don't share that particular concern because to me, that is an issue for any cohort study. All cohort studies in which people select into the study in some way. Some of those factors may relate to the exposure and some may relate to the outcome. It is, you know, potentially, I don't totally understand how the timing of things work in the UK Biobank study such that there might be more things affecting the outcome. But it just strikes me as this is something that happens in every cohort study. And I don't see why this one would be any different. It just means we have to pay really careful attention to what we adjust for in our analyses. What do you guys think of that? I agree. I don't think that this is... Very, not having too much background information on the UK Biobank, I, I agree. I don't see this as terribly different from most cohort studies. The thing that I'm more concerned about is removing people within the cohort study for the analysis. So like you mentioned, potentially people who aren't working. Also, those that have highly unrepresentative commuting distance, that to me seemed more likely to cause selection bias. So for example, they excluded people with I think who commuted more than 12 times per week, which I didn't totally understand why that was. Assuming that includes both to and from work, that might only be six days of work a week, which I don't think is terribly unrepresentative. And then also they yeah, excluded... Yeah, I think they did, they, did, they did deal with commuting to and from work. Right. And then they also yep. excluded people who had any missing data, it sounded like. Yeah, which I thought was problematic. Why not, you know, use an imputation method? So that those to me were bigger red flags. I think than overall, just the UK biobank maybe not being representative of the underlying population. Yeah, I mean, I suppose the concern isn't that it's not representative. The concern is that the selection, the reason why people choose to participate, would lead to potential for, you know, lack of comparability between your exposed and unexposed populations that you would need to control for analytically. And the more of those factors, the harder it is to control that. I mean, I think if I'm being honest, I think that is probably my biggest concern is, is you know, can, studies like this are so hard to remove all the confounding, just like with diet studies. People who commute to work are generally healthier than people who don't. At least that is my assessment based on what I see when I'm driving to work and all the people biking around me. And so I think you you have potential for confounding there that is tough to remove. I don't know. Yeah, I think, and I do think some of the measures, they were all baseline assessments of all these covariates. Um, most of them were self-reported and many of them were pretty crude measures. So, you know, dividing physical activity into five levels or, you know, urban versus rural home location. You know, I mean, it's very, yeah, pretty crude measures that they're, that they're using to adjust. Fair enough. Did, did either of you think about reverse causation at all in this one? I mean, so the idea would be that you are not cycling because you've had a you've had a, an injury and, uh, or the, you know, a hospitalization. I, that seems to be unlikely, but you could have stopped cycling because you have uh, a heart issue for the, for the cardiovascular 
outcomes. It seems to me that is theoretically possible. I don't know. Am I off pace here? Uh, I didn't think I didn't think about it much actually in this particular study, but I can see how. Yeah, I mean, I can see how if you had had an injury that, especially related to cycling, you may be less inclined to cycle in the in the future. I mean, I know personally several people who that has happened to, right? Who have been really avid commuter cyclers and then um, had a a really scary incident and have have never done that again. So um, that seems possible. And I don't I don't worry about it so much for that particular outcome, though, because I would I would assume they have the timing worked out well enough to know that, you know, a prior hospitalization wouldn't get included in this analysis. And so we're really if they had stopped cycling, well, I guess, you know, could be. But I'm more worried about it for the cardiovascular outcomes where, you know, a history of uh, family history of cardiovascular disease or something like that might in, may cause you to be more likely or to less likely to cycle to work. I don't know. I may be, I may be pulling at strings here. Um, I'm curious. I'm curious what you guys thought of the, so they did a number of kind of stratified analyses and the, the uh, one that was interesting was when they looked specifically by distance mm-hmm. of cycling and found that it seemed like commutes that were over five miles were associated with, with greater risk. I was, I was wondering what you guys thought of that finding or whether you bought it. Laura? I, I bought that, although I did find it a little surprising that they did not seem to see that association among other types of commuting. Because I would think that even with driving and walking, the longer time that you spend commuting, aren't you at greater I don't know. When I learned outcome? to drive, my parents always told me that most accidents occur within one mile I of your house. Of is that, that true? I thought of I that. I don't know if that's I true. Heard the same well, thing. It is true. <laughs> it is definitely true, and that is why you should move. <laughs> <laughs> I have. I did think of that, but then I thought, okay, but what if your commute is an hour versus five minutes? Like, can't? Isn't your time? At risk for being right. like whether hit you're by riding a, truck? a bus or in a yeah. car or so that yeah, to me no, was no, a little surprising. Is, this is exactly it, Laura. I mean, so the reason why most accidents happen within X miles of your home is because you spend the most time driving within X miles of your home. So it's not a... And so when I saw this anal- that analysis, my thought was, gee, shouldn't they have turned this into some kind of a measure of injury per, per mile commuted or mm-hmm. per hour commuted or whatever it is? And then I'm not sure whether or not that effect would last. I, I think, you know, that is just a function of more exposure they did do incidence rates they by yep. 10,000 miles commuted, yep. which I thought it was, yeah, mm-hmm. it was nice to look at it that way rather than just by person time. Yeah, I like that as well. Any other, any other thoughts that people had? I had a question. I wasn't totally sure I understood how they came up with this, these numbers that were presented in the abstract about... So it says, assuming results are causal, an estimated 1,000 participants changing their mode of commuting to include cycling for 10 years would result in 26 additional admissions to the hospital, et cetera, et cetera. So I found that odd because, well, for one thing, we're, I feel like it's, it's sort of making a leap that if you change your mode of commuting, mm-hmm. you'll have this uh, effect as opposed to just you already commuted that way. And that has to do with other factors, but also I'm not totally clear on how they calculated these numbers. I actually didn't see an explanation in the methods or results, which I might've just missed, but no, I I have this listed right here as something else that I didn't, I didn't really follow the specifics of my assumption is they're making, you know, a a sort of a number intent number needed to treat type calculation Mm -hmm. to try, you know, a a attributable, what is it? Attributable risk percent or attributable fraction. But so, and so that may be true based on the numbers that they've calculated. But I do think whenever you have to begin the sentence with, if the associations are causal, you know, it worries me a bit because I'm not totally convinced these, even if there's an effect, I'm not sure we've measured it, the exact effect. And, you know, there's definitely some confounding and potential for selection bias in here. I'm not sure I would go that far. And and as you said earlier, they spent a lot of time talking about policy. I mean, the discussion is largely focused on policy, which is not my favorite thing to see in a discussion section because, <laughs> you know, we don't make policy until we know things are causal. I mean, there are times when we do, but generally speaking, that's not how we work. And making policy is very different from finding an effect. We can find an effect and say, you know, just because there's an effect, we there are other things we need to weigh into this calculation. So I didn't, 
I didn't follow it, but I also just, you know, it, it, I didn't like the the decision to do that. Yeah, I agree. Can I ask one more question about that? Just about the one of the other stratified analyses that they did was looking at this date, whether or not the baseline assessment was before or after January of 2010. And they said they did that because there was some kind of bicycling infrastructure that changed in some areas at that time. Mm -hmm. But that's actually when they saw a greater risk. So the more recent assessment. So I was very confused by that. Does that mean that the infrastructure made it worse? Worse? more dangerous I this, I um, and it wasn't thing really down. explained very well yeah i agree yeah. i was like why 2010 it was never really explained and i thought the same thing why is why is the association stronger after that when we expect the opposite I, I mean it's possible that changes in infrastructure confuse people i have noticed that i'm not sure this would affect cyclists so much but i have noticed like near where i live on com ave they recently put in protected bike lanes which is great i think for the cyclists but like really scary for pedestrians because now people mm. are zooming right next to the sidewalk. And if you go to cross the street, like it's, if you're only looking at the car side of the street, like you could completely miss a bike flying at you, but that wouldn't, mm-hmm. wouldn't explain these results since this is comparing cyclists to other modes. I don't know. Yeah. I, I found that odd as well. I did too. I found it a bit of a head scratcher. I couldn't really sort that one out. Any other last points anyone wants to raise before we move on? I did like that lots of absolute risk rate differences, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. It was really nice. They were, they really include, included absolute measures for, for all their results. And for some of them, like when they were looking at incidents of cancer and cardiovascular disease mortality, I mean, the message that you get from the absolute versus the relative measures of effect are very different. So I did appreciate that. I did too. I really appreciated that. How did you feel about the sentence? There was a trend towards a stronger association of cycling with injury in those with baseline assessments after January 1st, 2010. I thought of you, Matt, and, trend. and how much you hate that phrase. I'm, I'm not a fan of that, of that particular <laughs> phrase. All right, let's, uh, let's move on to, to our second segment where we're going to talk about an example of a scientist uh, who's come forward to admit a mistake in some of her work. So it comes from a, a medium piece that uh, Julia Strand, Dr. Julia Strand wrote entitled When Science Needs Self-Correcting. And I'm actually going to read from it because I think her words are better than anything we could do. So she says, in 2018, I published a paper that reported the most interesting finding of my career. A year later, while trying to figure out why I could re- replicate the effect, I discovered a massive error in the original experiment. The central finding was the result of a software glitch and was completely untrue. Several months later, we ran a follow-up study to replicate and extend the effect and were quite surprised that under very similar conditions, the finding did not replicate. I consider everything that might be different between the studies, code, stimulus, quality, et cetera, et cetera. And she finally finds the issue. So she says, when I identified the error, I was shocked. I felt physically ill. I had published something that was objectively, unquestionably wrong. I had celebrated this finding, presented it at conferences, published it, gotten federal funding to keep studying it, and it was completely untrue. I was deeply embarrassed to have made such a stupid mistake, disappointed that my finding was junk, guilty for wasting everyone's time and polluting literature, and worried that admitting the error and retracting the paper would jeopardize my job, my grant funding, and my professional reputation." But obviously, she went on to rectify the situation, and it was not easy for her to do that. And she goes on to describe the difficulties and the challenges that she went through in in alerting her co-authors, alerting the project officer at the National Institute of Health. And she concludes with a couple sentences. She says, mistakes happen. We should embrace systems designed to reduce mistakes, but some will sneak through. When they do, it is in the best interest of scientific progress that they come to light. However, for individual researchers, there are many, many incentives not to reveal errors. I'm sharing this story to help normalize admitting errors. Although this process has been difficult, the consequences were much less dire than I had feared. Changing culture is hard, but one step towards building better science is publicly revealing our own errors and showing how we fix them. And I have tweeted about this. I have talked to you guys about this. I am blown away by this. I am so impressed because as she says, there is every incentive not to come forward. I mean, if she had not come forward, it's very likely this would have turned into just another example of a finding that failed to replicate. 
She found a, you know, something odd. It got published and, you know, oh, well, it happens. And that's, you know, part of science too, is that sometimes we do find the odd finding and we move on. But she came forward and and owned up to it, something that came at great personal risk to her. And so I'm curious your reactions to this. And Jen, why don't I start with you? Yeah. I mean, I, I also thought this was her not just coming forward about what happened to her scientific colleagues, but also very publicly by writing this article was very, very admirable. And I think what I hadn't really thought about previously was just how you wouldn't know exactly what you were supposed to do in that situation. I mean, she decided she was going to do the right thing, but exactly what that meant and all of the steps involved weren't exactly clear. It was this new process that she had to navigate. And it seemed like part of the article is that, you know, for people who want to do the right thing, we shouldn't make that more difficult than than it already is for them. So how then do we change the incentives? Because the incentives are not aligned with coming forward and doing what she did. And I, as I say, that is why I'm so impressed is because I could be wrong, but this doesn't strike me as something that was likely to have been discovered. But we want people to come forward because it's a waste of time and money for people to continue down a pathway that doesn't actually hold up. And so how do we... I mean, I think she kind of, she suggests maybe a different category of retraction, right? Where, you know, it's an author initiated retraction. And so you're not put in the same category with the authors who were falsifying their data, you know, on purpose, which is which is definitely not the situation that that she describes at all. And so if there if there was a another process and that could be somehow recognized, maybe that would help. I would agree. I would agree. Laura so Laura, do do are you like me in that things like this keep you up at night? Yes, definitely. <laughs> this is my worst nightmare. But at the same time, this is probably so much more common than we realize. And especially with something like her mistake had, I think it was like a, a bug in the program. So it wasn't something that you could even necessarily pick up by, you know, double checking your analyses. You'd have to go back to the initial programming of the, I think it was of the experiment and the timing. The, the experiment. Clock. So I, This is probably more common than we realize. And something that I thought was interesting that, you know, we have all these new initiatives um, or maybe not so new, but initiatives to try to make science more replicated more easily. So, for example, pre-registration and sharing data and code. And she did all of those things. Right. I'm pretty Mm -hmm, sure she said mm -hmm. that those in this case, those actually did not. That isn't how the issue was discovered. It, It was from her trying to replicate her experiment later on. So I think, you know, some of what we're doing to to try to stop these potential errors or or this lack of reproducibility is maybe not even going to solve a lot of these problems. But I, I also really liked that she wrote about this and made it more known and and described what she did because, like uh, Jen mentioned, there there really is no model for what to do when this happens to you. I think. I, I mean, I agree with you. There is no model. I think that we, you know, we should we should have our students reading things like this so that they are aware of this. I think, Laura, to your point, I, I sadly, I think these things are more common than we think because science is really difficult and there are so many details that have to get worked out and you, you know, you mess up one detail, you have the potential, like in this case, to to really have a long, uh, a deep impact. And I don't, you know, I, I have no way to assess how common it is, but I can, I can certainly say that I've been in a study where we had to publish a, uh, a correction because of, you know, some some errors that we made. You know, it almost seems like if we if we don't see more of these things, it's a sign that they are. It's almost like publication bias. I mean, it's a if we know they're happening, it means, and we aren't hearing about them. It means either people aren't looking for them or they're just identifying them and not telling us. I don't know. Thoughts? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think I like the connection to the publication bias here. I think this is something that, yeah, if we're not sharing how frequently it happens, it's it's just not known how, how often this is the case. So here here is the solution that I came up with for this problem is my thought was we need to have an award that goes out for uh, research integrity 
that someone like this could be nominated for an award. But then I realized, well, that's that net, that then changes the uh, incentives towards just finding a a, a failure or, or making failure uh, something that we want to happen so that we can then get awards for telling people about our own failures. So that didn't seem like a good idea. On the other <laughs> hand, I don't think anybody anybody chooses or, or really wants to be associated with a mistake like this. And I'm sure that, you know, Dr. Strand is going to go on and have a, a phenomenal career. And hopefully this, you know, is just a little tiny piece and it gets all forgotten about. And she doesn't want this to be her legacy. On the other hand, I think it's actually a real contribution. I agree. And I think for all of her mentees and the more junior people working with her at, at the time to have that sort of example set for you early in your career is um, is is probably ultimately very, very helpful. I do, too. All right. Any any last thoughts on this before we move on? I don't think so. All right. So we are now going to move on to our last segment, which is our favorite segment the amazing and amusing and laura you're our guest so do you want to do you want to go first this time sure okay so i found a paper in the one of the christmas editions of the bmj we love the christmas one, edition <laughs> yeah they're a lot of fun so this one was in 2015 so this is by carl maynard geisinger and colleagues so hopefully i pronounced that right this is a study on doctors coffee purchasing patterns while at work so i thought this was really mm. Interesting. So essentially they looked at, they used the data from the hospital. This is a large teaching hospital in Switzerland, and they use data from the electronic payment system of when doctors purchased coffee from the hospital cafeteria. So of course this doesn't account for coffee that you consume at home or from other sources, but they say that most people use this electronic payment system within the hospital because they have a really large staff discount. Of 45%. So they think this captures probably most coffee purchases that doctors make during the day. And they compare doctors across different specialties. So for example, surgery versus neurology, radiology, et cetera. And they found that, so they looked at the data across a full year and they found overall 84% of Doctors purchase coffee at one or more of the hospital cafeterias, and overall, over 70,000, almost 71,000 coffees were consumed in 2014 by doctors, which a lot of coffee. <laughs> seemed like a lot, especially <laughs> since I think the N here was 766 doctors total. So, <laughs> although, although, given how long the hours that doctors work, maybe I think I want them. Well, yeah, interestingly, I think they only were able to measure, I think maybe the cafeteria was only open for daytime most of the day, but they were not able to measure actually overnight coffee. And they did say that some doctors also have their own coffee machines in their offices. So we're definitely underestimating here. So that is, yes, I agree. We, we probably want people drinking coffee. So they found that orthopedic surgeons were the most, the, the biggest coffee drinkers, at least according to this data. So they had an average of 189 coffees per year, followed by radiologists at 177 and then general surgeons. So I thought it was fun. They had some funny lines on uh, why they think this might be. So they say in the discussion, uh, we tried to settle the debate as to whether surgeons, radiologists, or physicians drink more coffee. We believe we have finally clarified this important question unresolved for so Very many years. Yep. <laughs> it is, in fact, the orthopedic surgeons who drink the most coffee, which suggests either that their work hard, play hard, drink hard persona extends to the hospital canteens, highlighting their productivity, or that they have too much time to kill and can be found hanging out mm. in cafeterias, which is, which do you think of course, it is? unlikely. <laughs> I think it's probably the former. I don't know. Or maybe they're making more money and they have more money that they can spend on coffee. Also, interestingly, they found that the more senior doctors seemed to buy more coffee than the more junior doctors. And they also did something interesting where they they used the data to look at how many people would buy multiple coffees, assuming that they would bring them back for other people and found that senior doctors were more likely to do this, which is heartening. So hopefully they were going to share them with others who were more junior, which is kind of the opposite of, of what I might think watching like Grey's Anatomy when they always make like the medical interns go get the coffee. <laughs> and, and, and Grey's Anatomy is a documentary. <laughs> of course. <laughs> yeah. Um, let me see. There was one other uh, funny thing. Oh, the older, older doctors consumed more 
coffee too. And they said increased coffee intake might help fight age and fatigue to keep up with the younger workforce. <laughs> mm, <laughs> no, <laughs> that is Another popular opinion repeatedly expressed to the authors during daily qualitative groundwork for this study is that senior doctors have more time to socialize and network. And finally, they excluded cheap instant coffee from vending machines Obviously, for this analysis. Because it's <laughs> they not say, coffee. That's what they said, yeah. Although these beverages do contain <laughs> caffeine, we believe this brew does not merit the name coffee. <laughs> so true. <laughs> so I thought that, that was really true. Funny. Oh, that's really good. Okay, so I have a question. Mm -hmm. If we were to repeat this study in a school of public health, <laughs> which department, who consumes the most coffee? Would, what, what's your guess? Hmm. I don't know. Oh, maybe it's the department's in Crosstown because you have a coffee place in the building. We have to venture out. If we're no, see, no, you're going by coffee. you're going by by coffee. I'm meaning by profession. All schools of public health. Ah, um, I don't know. What do you think? I don't yeah, know. For I'm, some reason, I'm I think saying it's... I'm saying Epi because we best understand the health benefits ah. of coffee. I, for some reason, think it's the biostatisticians. Don't know why. Don't know why. <laughs> really? Yep. Anyway. I think, I think departments that with more Europeans would have, mm. right? I mean, I think this was in Switzerland. I'm, a, I'm was, imagining yeah. their coffee consumption is probably higher than ours. Okay. So, they did say something about that. So the, did they? The, okay. the chair of the uh, biostats department is, is a listener. So, Jose, if you're listening... <laughs> Let us know whether or not you think that I'm right, that the biostats department consumes more coffee than any other in the School of Public Health. All right. Well, that was really good. Can I, um, I'm going to go second. And to do that, I'm going to share my screen with you guys because I am committing a big no-no here in that I'm doing something visual for mine, but I will explain to the listeners. Okay. So this is a, this is a story that was published in um, the, the Tennessean. And I don't know much about the paper, The Tennessean, but I, I raise this particular story because this is a story about, once again, a biostatistician. Do you guys know Brian Shepard at Vanderbilt? No. No. So he's a, he's a fantastic biostatistician, if really a wonderful guy. And he was, he was and, and a couple of friends, colleagues were featured in this paper because of their cycling. So I thought this was one that related to our main story that we were talking about. And what you are looking at here is a Google map picture of, uh, I believe it's Nashville. And the red lines that you're seeing, can you see my screen? Yes. Yeah. So the red lines are places that he and a couple of friends, uh, their cycling route, <laughs> and their cycling route makes a really beautiful picture of Elvis Presley. Oh my gosh. And they, so they had <laughs> to amazing. obviously map this out to figure out exactly where they were going to go. They had to do like switchbacks in various places to, to get back onto the route. And they made a GPS map of Elvis. And the thing is, this is not the only one that they have done. They have done a bunch of other ones. And to me, this is just like, unbelievable use way one could use their time but so, they always do elvis no 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 no. Okay. no no they do they do different different things so just for for the listeners go out and google brian shepherd bicycling elvis route and it is a thing of beauty <laughs> that's pretty incredible and also ties nicely into our first segment it, it does do you know how many miles that route is i'm just curious it's a little hard to tell from the map exactly how far they had to go to make that beautiful I don't, Elvis. But it's, it looks pretty big to me it looks yeah. like they've covered yeah, a quite a wide swath of the the nashville area anyway i love it so maybe maybe that's it, it maybe what they really need to do is do one that is really like elvis across the entire united states Every city. <laughs> no, 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 no. One that is large enough. Oh, someone has that to. it could be oh, seen wow. from space, yeah. the route. <laughs> and you'd have to zoom the Google map all the way out. Probably take a little bit of time, but I, you know. Yeah. He could figure it out if anyone could. <laughs> yeah. We all, right. we all have that kind of time, right? We, we do. Oh, yeah. And now's the time. <laughs> no, we're supposed to stay indoors. Yeah. No, you're right. <laughs> all right, Jen. Last up, what do you got for us? Yeah, so this is one of those silver linings in our current crisis. You may have read about 
a couple of middle-aged pandas at a zoo in Hong Kong. So Ying Ying and Lili have been residents at the Ocean Park Zoo since 2007. And although they live together, there hasn't been a lot of romance between mm. Ying Ying and Lili. And you know, up until very recently, I think it was the 26th of January, there were most on most days visitors at the zoo. But they noticed that after the zoo closed, <gasps> um, yeah, Ying Ying and Lili started spending some more time together. <laughs> and sure enough, after two months of being alone together, it says the couple have recently shown signs they were in the mood for love. Whoa. Oh my God. Yep, and <laughs> it it happened. It happened, and now there some signs point to Lily being being pregnant. Wow. The other thing I thought that was interesting about this article is apparently I did not know this, but apparently pandas have a reputation for having a low sex drive, mm. but really that's all based on captive pandas. We don't really know what what if pandas are more frisky in the in the wild. Um, uh, Love the word but it frisky. seems like they, you know, they may just be modest. Well, that seems to I be mean, what's going on here. It kind of makes sense, right? I mean, yeah, it does. Absolutely. Finally yeah. had some privacy. Yeah. Oh my oh my. Well, that is good news indeed. Yeah, animals I, are thriving in, in zoos and such well, at this time, animals I think. Are, are taking over cities, and uh, yeah. have you seen the, I assume you've seen the videos of the penguins wandering around the zoo? I love uh, that, yes. The so aquarium. cute. So yeah. yes. cute. Uh, so many good things going on. Not all doom and gloom, so look for the good stuff. So that is the end of our program. If you've got any feedback on this or any other episode, or you want to suggest a study or a topic for us to take on, you can tweet us at at PopHealthyX, or you can tweet me at at Prof Matt Fox, Chris at ID.Gill, Jen at, at Jennifer R. Ryder, and Laura at... Uh, I think it's Laura Sampson 611. Can't Let's be too sure about that. go with that. <laughs> or you can find us on the Population Health Exchange website at www.pophealthyx. Dot org. We want to thank Leslie Talali and Director of Lifelong Learning at the BU School of Public Health for supporting the podcast and Nick Guler for sound editing and for talking us all through how to do this at home. Thanks for joining us. We hope you enjoyed it and we hope you will download our next episode. Bye.